Kriya Yoga and divine fires of wisdom. You know, we all carry from our, our soul, which is the eternal element within us that is seeking to reunite with, with God, that soul carries every memory of every thought, action, emotion that you've had, not only in this lifetime, but in all past lifetimes. And so those various thoughts and actions are like little vortexes of energy. In today's terminology, we might think of them like a hard disk, hard drive, has little magnetic uh, impressions of of memory. And so magnetic impressions of memory, those seeds, they call them seeds of karma, or, or some scars are the various tendencies we bring from the past. Well, much more than we would like to think, our past conditioning drives our perception of the world. It drives our actions. It drives how we react how we feel about things, the words we say, it, it, that karmic, uh, one might say, train that we're on is very powerful. One time, uh, Ananda Moy Ma was asked the question, um, how much free will do we actually have? How much is determined by karma? And how much is determined by, by our our own free will in this life. She said, think of it this way. You're on a train and you're riding on that train, which is your karma, to a destination. And the train is going to that destination, but you still have some free will. You can walk to the front of the train or you can walk to the back. And so according to how we tune in, uh, those seeds of karma will have stronger or lesser effect on us. So coming to the question about Kriya Yoga, by the movement of energy in the subtle, subtle body, the uh, subtle spine especially, uh, the Shashumna, that's where these seeds of karma reside. By movement of energy through that, we create a powerful flow of magnetism and that magnetism actually destroys those seeds of karma so yogananda teaches us that kriya yoga one of the benefits is that one could say that magnetic flow is like holding that hard drive up to a powerful magnet it it just releases those though that that memory the memory of the hard drive and so by attuning our will to the will of God and Guru, and by practicing these techniques, we burn up those seeds of karma so that they can't germinate. When we do the fire ceremony, I'll just end with this, um, we, we offer usually, at, at least in America, we offer two things. We offer ghee, which represents the purified Emotion, because ghee is purified butter, it represents the purified emotion which has turned to devotion. And we offer that into the light of the fire, which is the light of God or the light of the spiritual eye. Then we offer seeds of rice into the fire. By offering those seeds of rice, if we took those, those rice seeds and we planted them, put them in the right environment, they would not only grow, they'd produce more seeds of rice. So by burning them up in the fire, they can't germinate. And that's what he's talking about here, is that in that powerful flow of energy and light, like the fire, we, we burn up those seeds of karma so that they can't germinate and they won't cause us any more trouble or anyone else. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just add a bit here. Thank you for that question. It's an important one. Um, the context of that sentence was 
Master's family was always trying, in autobiography of Yogi, was always trying to deter him from following the spiritual life. And so some astrologer, the family called some astrologer, and uh, the astrologer drew his chart and said, ah, you will be married three times, twice a widower. And Master burnt that, he was a young man, before he came to America, he burnt the chart and put the ashes in a bag and gave it to his elder brother, Ananta, who was the main culprit trying to dissuade him. And he wrote on that, seeds of past karma cannot germinate when roasted in the fires of Kriya Yoga. So that's the important, what Jatish said about Kriya and the, rate, the energy itself being, uh, Swamiji put it so well, he said, the real fire ceremony is Kriya Yoga, because that's where you're burning up those seeds literally, not just symbolically. But it's important to realize, again, on this theme of using our own willpower, so often people, they'll go to an astrologer or a palm reader and say, oh, I have bad karma, oh, this is a period I can't accomplish anything. Master said, you show me the worst period astrologically in my life, and I will accomplish everything I set out to do. And he said, granted, in retrospect, it was more difficult than it might have been, but nevertheless, I did it. So, again, to transcend this sort of karmic passivity and say, oh, well, you know, I'm in the bad Mahadosha now, so what's the use? You know, no. You use that determination and willpower, and you can overcome anything. Okay, so <laughs> this is a little complex question, especially for those who may not have had Kriya Yoga or even those who may not be studying level two of the teachings, which is the art and science of Raja Yoga, which has these teachings in them. But the essence of what Swamiji is talking about there, and Kriya Yoga brings energy up and down the spine, the astral spine. And each of the chakras represents, as well as the chakras, it represents one of the sun signs. So if you bring energy up through six signs and back down through six signs, that is like the earth going around the sun for the passage of a year. So that one single Kriya can be the equivalent for spiritual development, not for the age of the body, thank goodness. I'd be about three million years old in this body otherwise. Um, but for the spiritual development, that movement of Kriya up and down is the equivalent of one year. So depending on how many Kriyas you do and how many Kriyas or similar techniques you have done in past lives, gradually you make uh, spiritual progress, meaning that your consciousness grows closer and closer until finally it achieves the realization of who we really are, which is just expressions of the one creator of the universe. We're just, we aren't really who we think we are. That's the problem. So the, the soul identifies with this body and personality, which is called the ego. So gradually we dissolve that, one might say, not not the body, we dissolve the delusion that we are this body, the limit, we dissolve the limitations. So, but that evolution, one might say evolution of the soul, it's a little improper to say that, but I use the term, the evolution of the soul it carries on, but, um, you know, even three million years is not going to end the cycle. Nonetheless, um, we wouldn't be drawn into the desire to practice these teachings unless we were already well along that pathway toward self-realization. So the one thing I'll end with is to say for those of you who do have a Kriya initiation, uh, a single meditation you can do as many Kriyas as you would live years in a single lifetime. And so think of uh, this coming week, 
starting today. If you practice Kriya, if you have Kriya, if you practice that twice a day, you can have the equivalent um, spiritual evolution of perhaps 14 lifetimes. So which seems more efficient to you? To practice your Kriya Yoga or to reincarnate 14 more times for for an entire lifetime? I, I, I choose the first. Tell the story about when you were in Darjeeling. <laughs> we were in Darjeeling. There's another statement in the autobiography that says um, one million years of living harmoniously and disease-free will free one from delusion. And so we were in uh, Darjeeling with Swami Kriyananda and we were driving and we had passed a, a slum area and the children were kind of dirty and they were playing at the side of the road and so on. And then about three blocks later, we passed a whole group of children all dressed in uniforms and um, a teacher marching them along very happily headed to school. And I, I got thinking, what a, what a, in just two blocks, what a big change of karmic circumstances. And so I, I was calculating this mathematically the way you were. <laughs> calculating a million years and all right if we live 66 and anyway I came up with 30,000 lifetimes and so I proudly said to Swamiji you know it takes at least 30,000 lifetimes to achieve self-realization and he kind of turned and he said where did you get that tiny figure <laughs> And I explained my nice calculations. He said, you need to read a little more carefully. How many of those years that you would live were completely harmonious and disease-free? He said, it takes much, much longer than that. So it takes this journey is a long time. But I will say this, that by the time we're even interested in self-realization, by the time we ask the question, how can I find God? We're almost there. As Ananda Moy Ma put it so beautifully, she said, every wish that we have has to be fulfilled. Swami Kriyananda asked Master, even if we wish for an ice cream cone, when we're a little, we have to fulfill that wish? Master said, oh yes, but you can do it also in thought. You don't have to reincarnate until you get an ice cream cone anyway. Um, so uh, she, she said, every wish that we have, we must fulfill. But the wish for freedom and the wish for self-realization is the final wish because it is only that wish that will end all other wishes. And so that desire is by the time you have that desire, it too must be fulfilled. And it is the final great desire that we're all working on. Just, oh, wait one minute, we will have one more. I want to reply to this as well. Then we will have your question, Madam. But um, I will not wade into the realm of mathematics, because that is not my strong suit. But I will say this, when, um, remember we quoted Ananda Moy Ma saying you have a choice of going to the front of the train or going to the back, and that's the extent of our free will. But remember, if you choose to go to the front of the train by practicing meditation and Kriya Yoga, you get off the train sooner. So that's very, very encouraging. And then finally, in math, using a little bit of numbers, Master was quoting the scriptures and saying, out of a thousand, one perhaps seeks me, Krishna says in the Gita, and out of a thousand who seek me, one perhaps finds me. But Master said, our numbers are much better. <laughs> okay, Madam, you had a question. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. So, 
uh, why are some children born in the slums and some born in good circumstances? Is it karma? And does everybody have to work on their karma in order to achieve a better life? The answer is yes, it is karma. And But let's understand that karma is not punishment. Karma is simply the curriculum that we have in that particular lifetime. Yogananda said that all of life was God created life for our education and entertainment. And then he said wryly, ah, but how few are either educated or entertained. And so the circumstances that we find ourselves in, in the soul's long journey, is simply the lesson plan that we need for that particular life. And so most people, most in the slums, they need somehow the lesson that is there. Maybe it's the great desire has to be planted in them to do whatever they can to improve their circumstances. And, and so they learn that, whatever it is, it can be very complex. Perhaps a high soul is born in the slums in order to help others or in order to finish off some little train of karma that's left. As Swamiji put it, we have to balance everything until the, the assets and the deficits are all brought to zero and it all comes back balanced out to zero. So maybe a person of a high person is born in a slum because they're just balancing out some final little debt on their ledger. Or maybe it's that that's an early lifetime. It's very complex and unless a master knows. But yes, it is all our, the circumstances of our birth are due to the karmic lessons that we need in that particular lifetime. And how we live this life will determine, one, the circumstances of our next birth, but two, if there even is a next birth. And that's what we're all after, is the point at which we don't have to incarnate because we've become free in our consciousness. So I'll just end very briefly, and then we have other things that were in response to this question. Swamiji said once he was traveling in India, and a small group of bigger children came up to him, please, please, please. And he said, but one of them was different. He said she, it was, it was like she would, had been a queen, but she had been selfish and undif indifferent to other people's needs and suffering. And she had been born in that circumstance for her to learn compassion and service to others. He said she just, there was like a regalness and slight embarrassment to be begging, and yet she had drawn those circumstances. So I think we could go on much longer for questions, but we have now a very nice um, little blessing that we want to offer. <laughs>